I'm Gary Jacobs, the president of the World Academy of Art and Science. And we're extremely pleased to be here for the second year in a row, partnering with CTA on the theme of human security for all. A word about our, our campaign and our academy. We were founded in 1960 by very eminent scientists and intellectuals, one of them who's been in the movie theater quite a lot last year, Robert Oppenheimer, who was concerned about the implications of science and technology if it's not handled uh, properly. That's our er origin. Two years ago, we entered into collaboration with the United Nations Trust Fund on Human Security, where we were asked to partner with them on a global campaign on the messaging of human security for all, something that applies to all of us and impacts on all of us. We're extremely grateful to the Consumer Technology Association and CES for inviting us here last year to launch the campaign uh, and, uh, and then to invite us back again uh, this year to go further with it. And we're also deeply grateful to the United Nations for the support they've given us and the importance of the message that they're trying to get out to the world. And we're very fortunate to have with us today the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy for Technology, uh, Amandeep Singh, Singh Gill, uh, and the Chairman of Panasonic USA, one of the oldest members of the of CTA uh, and longest standing, Megan Lee, and thank you both for joining us, so that we can explore the challenges and the opportunities of technology and innovations in technology and the potentials of technology, as well as the challenges that we face in being sure that the knowledge we develop, the technology and inventions and innovations we develop, go to the very purpose we all have, which is to maximize the human security of everybody on the planet. And that's our conversation here today. So I'd like to start our discussion uh, by uh, requesting uh, Amandeep, if I may, to tell us about when and why the UN Secretary General established a technology envoy. What is your mission? What are your goals? And centrally, what is the message here for members of CTA and members of the industry? And this, I think you notice, though we call it the consumer electronics industry, it's, it's hard to figure out anybody who's not here. <laughs> uh, this, the, the scope of CTA and CES has expanded so much that uh, from cosmetics and perfumes and uh, women's fashion, we saw in, in the opening, very impressive, now to automobiles, which are filling up the main uh, chamber. We're talking about really all, th everything's technology today. So please. Absolutely, and thank you very much, Gary. It's a pleasure to join you here. Uh, and uh, pleasure to <laughs> be with you, Megan. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited to be here at CES uh, as an electronics engineer. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really bedazzling. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the question you asked, uh, why a technology envoy for the United Nations? Uh, technology impacts all of our mandates today, whether it's peacekeeping, humanitarian operations, uh, whether it is misinformation, disinformation <coughs> about uh, vaccinations, uh, or it is complex issues related to geopolitics uh, around the governance of the internet or the governance of AI. Uh, so literally all our three pillars, peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights are impacted in good ways and in not so good ways by technology. So we needed a capacity uh, that uh, brings together uh, a whole of UN perspective on technology. Just as many governments today are uh, endeavoring to have a whole of government perspective 
on critical technologies, whether it's semiconductors uh, or it is artificial in intelligence. And then there's also a need at the UN, which is a demand signal it's coming from our stakeholders, <laughs> uh, governments, member states of the UN, uh, private sector and civil society. They need uh, a point of contact uh, to speak to about technology policy issues, implications of artificial intelligence for the sustainable development goals, uh, human rights implications of what goes on online. So those were the reasons that the Secretary General decided to set up this uh, uh, new institution. And I've been in this job for a year and a half. And you asked me, what's the purpose? What's the mission, really? Uh, the mission is to leverage technology responsibly to advance the UN's mandate, particularly on the sustainable development goals, while making sure that through governance, through international collaboration, uh, we can manage the risks and manage the downside. And the downside is quite considerable uh, from misinformation, disinformation. Uh, more than half the world goes to elections this year. Uh, so these technologies, uh, their misuse can distort um, the, uh, the voice of the people, um, can subvert democracy, and all the way to warfare with the use of lethal autonomous weapons that could um, escape the remit of international humanitarian law, which provides for clear distinctions between civilians and uh, military objects. So those are the kind of things that uh, uh, motivate uh, us and that, that keep us busy. We have one particular milestone ahead of us, and that's the Summit of the Future in September this year, where a global digital compact is part of the outcomes. Uh, this will be a first leader's level, 360 degree look at the digital world, its opportunities, its risks, and how to come together as, uh, um, uh, as one humanity to um, uh, govern digital technologies for the benefit of everyone. Thank you so much. Megan, Gary Shapiro, in the opening remarks that mm -hmm. he made on Tuesday morning, yes. he mentioned that Panasonic, the only company he mentioned in those oh, yeah. was uh, <laughs> Panasonic, which has been around with before whatever became CTA in yes. the evolution yes. from the very beginning. Yes. Uh -huh. And I understand, and he also mentioned that this is the 50th Consumer Electronics Show, mm -hmm. and you said that Panasonic has been to all of them. Almost, yes. Almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you clearly have a, the company has a long perspective, a long history of the growth and development of this industry, mm -hmm. not only nationally, and of course today uh, CES is, is no longer a national phenomenon, <laughs> though it's a, uh, so you've got the perspective. Yes. And uh, now I'm looking back on the perspective of Panasonic over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. How do you, how does the company respond to this idea mm -hmm. of a corporate responsibility yes. for human security? Yes. Uh, and trace for us something of the development of this up until the present time. Sure, sure. Um, but first of all, I really want to say thank you to, be, to both of you being part of this conversation. I feel extremely honored as part of uh, being a, a corporation, so thank you. Uh, Panasonic is a um, 105 years old company in the US. We're about 65 years old. And we started as a, we're talking about cassette tape, and there are some early products that were uh, purely on consumer electronics. And um, I hope some of you have our, and still do have our products, whether it's a phone and TV and microwave ovens. So we're, that's our heritage. Uh, but in 65 years, just in US, we completely innovated um, and changed our focus into more B B2B, especially in the area that we can uh, create a sustainable energy. So EV battery is the largest business that we have in North America right now. Mm -hmm. 
and um, those transition didn't happen by chance. Our uh, founder, when he created a company um, 100 plus years ago, he had a strong conviction that companies should exist only to contribute to the society. And if we're not adding value to the society, regardless of where we are, for example, for us in US, if we're not adding value to the society, we will not be successful as a business. So he felt that it's a relationship that we have with the end users and community that as long as we add value and we're responsible, we should be able to run a healthy business. We will not go for to maximize the profit to take the opportunity so that we can financially be successful. We care more about making sure that we're a responsible business. And as long as we do that, we'll be a healthy business as well. So that's how we manage our business. That's how we manage our business still after 100 years. A lot of technologies have come and gone, and we're talking about AI, but we don't look at it as any differently than we have in the past. So that's how we see it. Your message is very relevant and touches me deeply because 40 years ago I did research in companies that had grown and developed over many of them over 100 years or mm -hmm. 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the thing, the central characteristics mm -hmm. I found of those who continued to develop and change with the times over a long right. time was right. they never considered profit the number one or the most important right. thing. They were always looking at their relationship to the society yes. and how they are keeping pace with the aspirations, changes, and needs in the society, yes. and serving those needs. Yes. And yes. that's exactly what I'm not surprised to hear uh, uh, from you at, at Panasonic. That's really impressive. The one thing that's changed, and that's what I meant to say earlier, and I lost my thought for a minute, uh, that when CES was started, it was almost all American companies uh, and uh, uh, an American audience. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, I, what, uh, what Walt says, he calls this the world's fair of technology. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a global event now. I think something like 40% of the visitors, something like 40% of the exhibitors, and you could see that walking through downstairs, and even the press. Uh, last year, we had about 5,000 members of the press, and about 40% of them were from all over the world. And that has great relevance and for, for you being here, Amandeep, because the idea of, it used to be that the, the, the responsibility and the impact of governing technology or getting the, the thing right was at the national level, because it was only impacting the national level. But today, the market is purely global, and the products we're dealing with are going global. And when you talk about governance or getting that right, that balance between what's going to serve the society and what's going to cause problems, uh, no national government has the capacity to do that. Yes. Either on what's coming in or what's, uh, what's going out, really. So it really requires a global approach. And I think that's one of the import very important roles that the multilateral organizations play and also one of the great challenges that you play, because I think you have about 193 member countries <laughs> that you have to juggle with. So I think you can expand on that as to, you know, it's one thing we try to manage technology at the local level, whether it's drinking water or a power plant or something like that. It's, a number, it's another thing when we have to get coordination and understanding uh, at the global level among those who are buying and those who are selling too. Absolutely. The degree of interdependence today across the globe is such, uh, and the speed with which these technologies are adopted. I mean, just compare the Gutenberg Bible with chat GPT in terms of adoption. Uh, so y you have no option but to think of the impact and the response in global terms. Now, whether we are doing that successfully or not, you know, that's a debate to be had. But I think there's no escaping the fact that this cannot be handled nationally, even by the most 
powerful, most capable nations on the planet. You know, you saw that with the uh, uh, cryptocurrency problem. Uh, last year, you see that with social media platforms. Uh, you will see that with AI because the data and AI um, uh, value chain uh, is going to be much more complex than some of the product uh, supply chain that we see and the issues there around copyright, around intellectual property rights, societal implications, where responsibility lies are going to be much more complex than the analog physical uh, supply chain. So we'll have to um, uh, do this internationally. And I think there are a few advantages to an approach through a multilateral institution like the UN. One is you have the legitimacy. Uh, you cannot say that the UN has a commercial agenda or a particular national agenda. So there is trust and at a time when there are geopolitical tensions around technology and this is not to be scoffed at. So at least, you know, People may be reluctant, but reluctantly they listen to something that's coming out from there. Uh, and the other thing is that there's already a foundation of norms, values, commitments, whether it's the human rights side or it's the sustainable development agenda, those 17 sustainable development goals that have been adopted by the international community which can frame these discussions, which can bring us together. And even at the level of engineers and designers, they can provide a purpose. Uh, everyone today, young people today in particular, are looking for purpose. They just don't want to do something just for the sake of you know, a paycheck at the end of the day. They are looking for societal purpose. So I think these international frameworks also provide that uh, purpose. And Gary, I love the example that you brought in right at the outset of um, uh, Oppenheimer. So with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, as electronics engineers, as coders, we've not been used to, we've not been conditioned to think ourselves as very powerful. Nuclear scientists got that message pretty early. Uh, but for this community, it's just beginning to happen that like doctors have certain oaths, like you know, uh, first do no harm, or architects have certain licensing requirements and there are strict professional codes. In this sphere also, as we unleash more innovation, as AI seeps into different products, I think the societal implications are going to be quite complex and everyone has to assume greater responsibility. You've said it very well, uh, Amandi, better than I can. Uh, when our founders were involved in the work on the nuclear energy, they never thought of themselves as responsible for society. <laughs> they were scientists inventing and trying to fulfill the needs of the country and never dreaming that 60, 75 years later, <laughs> the consequences of what they did would be not only uh, coming back to our society, but to the whole world. And it was that was led to the founding of the World Academy. And I think they never had dreamed at that time, and neither did we, that 75 years later we would have another technology emerging with tremendous capacity for good, for, uh, for benefiting and, and advancing the world, but also posing unknown challenges which we can't even yet imagine uh, today. Uh, and, uh, and that's a job that has fallen to those who are involving developing the technology, to the national governments and to the UN. Sounds like you have a very challenging job to do. <laughs> uh, uh, Megan, let's go, the, I'd like to hear the rest of your story from we got up maybe up to date, mm -hmm. but talk about how does Panasonic see the future and how does it see uh, its relationship to the rapid changes that are taking place in, the, in global society uh, uh, over time and what are the implications of that for your company? So um, as a 105 years old company and our founder actually had a very humble beginning and he didn't even finish the elementary school uh, level of education. And he had a really not, he was not a healthy person when he was young. 
and uh, his doctor told me that you may not live beyond 20 years old. So uh, he had to find a way to work with more people and collecting the wisdom uh, was his way of getting um, the business done. Uh, he had, when he, um, towards to the end of his career, he had a 250 years vision for Panasonic, yes. Years. And we're almost right in the middle of it. As we become a um, technology driven company and as climate becomes an issue, we realize that our mission should be where we can contribute to the society in a way that we can, uh, we can be a um, positive and responsible corporation, not adding to the pollution and um, what's happening with, with the uh, environment. So for about three, four years, uh, we have a mission we call Panasonic Green Impact. And we're making a lot of investment, even something early in the stage that we may not make money or become commercialized right away, but we're trying very different things to make sure that we're not only um, producing the products that can contribute the EV electrification of the transportation, but also circular economy, how we produce the products, how we manufacture the products, how we manage the supply chain. So uh, we're here uh, for CES, and if you come to our booth, we have, uh, we're showcasing a lot of early technology that can eventually have a positive impact for the environment. And you talked about purpose. I'm with, uh, uh, I'm with Panasonic for now 36 years altogether. And if I didn't build, and I'm not a Japanese, but if I didn't believe the value and the purpose that uh, we talk about at work, I probably wouldn't be here still and talking about what we can do as a corporation to deliver healthy value to the society. And you mentioned about profit. Um, it's not like our founder was light on profit. He said, if you're not making money, changes are you're not, the customer's not recognizing it. The profit is the recognition of customers. So make sure that you have a healthy um, business with a profit. So, and that's a way to measure our contribution too. So uh, we're still early on in our 200 years of journey. I'm very um, confident that we'll get there with our core, core value and principles. And we're excited to go further from here. So we can tell you uh, more about what we do next year. Megan, that's really inspiring. I've heard and studied a lot of visionary entrepreneurs, but 250 year vision, <laughs> that's a record for me. So he, that's He knew really, how to dream big. <laughs> <laughs> that's really impressive. Uh, going back to uh, Amandeep, your role, uh, technology is exploding in its development and its impact on the world. Looking at the developing world now, because your responsibility is global, uh, what, are the te what are the technologies that you see are having the greatest impact on transforming or accelerating the development uh, in, 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 country, in other countries in the, in the developing world? What are the areas where you think that new breakthroughs in technology could have the biggest impact on the different issues related to human security? health, food production, uh, a sense of personal safety, uh, uh, economic development, uh, uh, creation of new jobs, uh, uh, all of the things that were politically, you mentioned this, this point about uh, uh, elections uh, uh, coming up and all, uh, about uh, how do we ensure that the electorates half of the world's population, I think you said, are, are gonna go, be going to the polls this year. How do we ensure that the electorate is knowledgeable, informed about making the, making the right decisions? But what are the areas where you see the biggest need and the biggest potential for technology to come to, to help us? Right, so uh, this is the bright side of the story. Uh, and uh, you see, uh, how digital technologies, for example, are accelerating financial inclusion. Uh, I think this was mentioned in the video that was played before this panel started. Um, in Brazil, in India, you see 
uh, hundreds of millions of people coming into the financial mainstream at a pace that was not imaginable before. And it is not just bank accounts, but it's also access to uh, uh, credit, uh, to uh, insurance, um, lowered costs of participating in the digital economy. Uh, and the digital economy component of some of the emerging economies is growing two to two and a half times faster than the rest of the economy. So it's a huge opportunity to lift people out of poverty, to bring them into the economic mainstream, and in particular, bridge the last mile gap for delivery of government services, whether it's getting a driving license, you know, the time saving uh, for individuals, uh, the plugging of leakages, reduction of corruption in terms of direct benefit transfers and so on, um, the wages for uh, garment workers in Bangladesh, for instance, uh, companies such as H&M have moved to digitized wage payments, which means you know uh, the women at home get to uh, access um, uh, the, the pays. It's not spent on drink or something else. So there are multiple benefits of the digitization of uh, last mile uh, delivery of uh, goods and services, financial inclusion. The other suite of technologies that's uh, really having a transformative effect is uh, uh, clean energy, green energy technologies. You would mention the circular economy uh, with uh, the costs of uh, solar panels, uh, uh, and uh, smart uh, grid solutions coming down, SCADA systems that help you save energy uh, in buildings in cities. Uh, there is a transformative impact uh, in uh, developing countries in uh, particular. The areas that I'm most excited about when you look at the 17 sustainable development goals, uh, particularly in terms of in the application of data and AI, um, are agriculture and food security health, uh, the green transition in all its aspects, including the circular economy, but also uh, smart energy, um, the um, um, access to education, quality education, uh, and then disaster prevention, early warning systems, disaster response, uh, reducing the human cost, uh, human suffering, uh, property damage from uh, various um, disasters, including climate change induced uh, uh, disasters that will be more uh, frequent as we go along. So overall, it's a very positive scenario, but I want to underline that this is not going to happen automatically. Uh, you know, the invisible hand is not going to do this. Uh, so for instance, in the case of last mile services, financial inclusion, you need to invest in digital public infrastructure. Uh, where the private sector and the public sector need to work together. Uh, smart collaboration, smart governance. Uh, you also need to uh, enhance connectivity. We still have 2.7 billion people who are not connected to the internet. You need to have affordable devices. You need to have meaningful content in local languages, in local contexts. For example, farmers, they need to be able to access uh, information in their own language, in their own uh, context. So, effort is required, it's not just going to fall from the heavens. Uh, countries, developing countries need to catch up very quickly on the foundation of the digital economy, invest in data interoperability, um, data flows, improve data flows, build up their own modeling capacity. Not everyone has to build um, LLMs at the scale that's being done in OpenAI and companies of that stature. But there are um, uh, models that can be done uh, at other levels with limited compute resources, but you need the human resource for it, you need the data for it, and this uh, is uh, something that has to be done urgently. Thank you so much. You're, you reminded me in your comments about, the, uh, you talked about financial inclusion, and I think in the recording, in the video also, there was a reference to it. And there's a history that some of you who were here last year might be interested in. Last year, my colleague Katan Patel, who I think he's in the audience, uh, uh, from Force for Good, released a report on technology as a force for good at CES. It was first in, 
released here. And one of the panel discussions was on three representatives from the Indian financial industry describing this dramatic turnaround that was taking place where over the period of less than a decade, uh, about 500 million people were brought within the financial system into banking, into access uh, to credit, to insurance, to subsidies and, and other things. And that story had a follow-up to it because then in, I can't remember whether it was March or April, uh, but in New York, uh, the representatives of the Indian government came. The India was the president of G20 last year. And you were present at that meeting, Amandeep, I believe, where India announced that this, they call it the India stack of technologies which have been developed and applied over such a massive area that India was offering it to the world uh, to, to accelerate development. So I think it's a very dramatic example of what the potential is, the power to leap generations and, and skip decades in the development in different areas. And we hope the same thing happens with medicine and other uh, fields as well. And I'll just mention that yesterday, the, the, next, the second technology as a force for good report was also released actually uh, at, C, at CTA or at CES. Uh, actually, there was a, uh, a meeting here uh, I think on Monday, uh, but the actual release to the public went out on uh, yesterday. And I would encourage all of you uh, who are interested in the big picture of how technology is transforming the world and what the top companies in the world, uh, the biggest technology companies in the world are doing, uh, to look at forcegood.org where that report is now freely available to everybody. And I'll just mention that one of the things they've done is identified 19 technologies, emerging technologies, that can virtually address the major challenges confronting humanity. Uh, and, uh, and that's not ex in exclusive of others, but it shows how powerful uh, the emerging technologies can be as a force for good. Megan, we're running out of a little time now, and I have so many questions I want to <laughs> ask you both. But one particularly important one is about the role of how we prepare youth, mm -hmm. our future scientists, technologists, who are dealing with this technology of knowledge of tremendous power, but with tremendous impact on society. Mm -hmm. And what type of education? Uh, how adequate is the education we're giving now to really prepare the next generation, or even this generation for that matter, to understand the responsibilities that we have for how it's used? Uh, we feel naturally very um, um, strongly about the education of the future generation. Uh, we do work with, we are building a factory in Kansas, and. Um, and we're working with local county community colleges so that we can prepare a program for them and when they graduated, they can uh, work with us um, at a EV battery factory. But in addition to that, uh, we have a, what we call Panasonic Foundation. Uh, it's in US for about almost 40 years. And uh, we have been focusing on STEM education as all, uh, a lot of other foundations do uh, that are focused in education. Um, and we have a program actually called that we announced with the uh, Olympian Katie Ledecky. She's the most decorated Olympian and we have a partnership with her as well. Um, what I'm personally most proud of though, um, I believe STEM is really important. The science, technology, uh, mathematics, engineering, I do believe it's really important and it will have a impact for your future earnings and career. I'm an art major, and I don't think, however, I'm an art major, and I don't think I'll be who I am today if I didn't have the four years of daydreaming when I was maturing. Mm. And I do think it's important that sometimes we stop and procrast procrastinate and daydream about everything and ponder 
And uh, not everything is a mathematics equation. And I don't want us to uh, forget about that part of growing up. So we call it, we have a director of our Panasonic Foundation here too, but we call it STEM with A and we call it STEAM. And we're very proud that we're not losing the side of artistic human side. We're all living a lot longer than before. Uh, we have a long um, journey of not just working, but understand why we do what we do so we can understand the purpose in all different aspects of what we do. So I am very proud of, thank you. <laughs> so your comments really resonate with the audience and they certainly resonate with us because one of the, when I'm speaking on behalf of the Academy, one of our feelings is that uh, the key to the future of technology very much depends on the kind of education we give to our youth to understand not just the technology and the know-how, but the relationship of that to human beings right. and to society. And uh, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, about seven years ago, we, had a, we did a conference in Italy with IEEE, the experts in uh, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing, and we asked them, uh, these were people from all over the world, uh, and we asked them, how far are our youth who are trained in technology getting exposed to the social impacts of technology, the social challenges, the social responsibility, to understand how it's going to be used. That's a lesson our founders at the Academy learned the hard way uh, 60, 70 years ago, and we want to be sure that the next generation is wiser uh, than our wise people have been in the past. And so I think we all know, and it's it's, you know, it's, under, it's interesting that at a time when we have unprecedented knowledge, unprecedented technological power, unprecedented prosperity, lifespan, health, considering comparing with any time uh, in, the fut in the past, and yet there's a sense of insecurity, almost a growing sense of insecurity, that we're, we're not sure what's going to happen in the future. Even though things have been getting better for a long time, we're still not quite sure what's going to happen to my jobs when AI uh, uh, comes out uh, and so forth, and, and when it goes uh, to, to future uh, developments and all. And so uh, this, how do we take that into account? Now the companies are being faced with that dilemma. They're, they're creating miracles, technological miracles. <laughs> But they're not only raising the prospect of, uh, of phenomenal advances, they're raising the prospect of phenomenal uh, challenges. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And so at the level of education, we have to start with it. And uh, uh, Amandi, but as your, uh, I ask from your side, how do you deal with, how does the world deal with this issue? We're trying to do good. We're trying to use technology as a force for good. We're trying to address the real human security needs. That's why we're here, and that's why CTA uh, invited us to be here uh, to talk about it. But how do we grapple with this double-edged sword? Yeah, no, we have a real dilemma. We have godlike technology. Uh, we have medieval institutions and paleolithic brains. So we have, I think, an educational deficit we have an institutional deficit. So while we are racing ahead with technology, we are not investing enough in our analog institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm afraid some of the investments in technology we are making will rewrite the software of society. If, for example, you know, some of the products that are being put out right now where people see money um, have more, an impact on societal relationships, uh, Dating, for instance, you know, is moving mostly online for good or for bad. But if you have more synthetic relationships uh, between uh, bots and humans, what does it mean for our society? We've not even started thinking about these issues. So we need, really need um, conversations around this, uh, thoughtful reflection, more assumption of responsibility in terms of 
you know, what the private sector does, what the designers do, more assumption of responsibility by governments who've been under investing in public technology, in public institutions, in public education, and by international institutions who need to bring governments and other stakeholders together in new ways to govern these technologies for everyone. And last thing I'd say is, we've just released the interim report of the Global AI Advisory Body, the Secretary General set it up recently. That's an attempt to start a conversation around artificial intelligence. You know, so before it's too late, um, I think we have a small window of opportunity. We need to seize it and get going. Thank you so much. <coughs> Our time is running out, and I'd just like to uh, end with the statement that uh, I think I want to thank CTA and CES again for bringing us in and recognize the first time in the 50-year history of the CES show last year, they gave a theme for the show, Human Security for All, and then invited back again and made it the theme here. I think that shows really uh, a, a, an awareness of the fact that we have to keep in mind not only the excitement of the technology, but after all, technology is here to meet our needs to make our society better and safer for everybody. And when CTA put this all together, that's the, that's the combination we need. We need everybody involved, every company involved, every in the industry, every uh, research organization to be thinking of the whole and the ultimate purpose, which is that we'll all be safer uh, and happier in the future. Thank you very much.